Um, you're, you're very welcome back after that very uh, delicious uh, lunch. I'm well aware that the lunch was so delicious that it may prove um, something of a reason to fall asleep. So um, I'm, a visitor, I'm a visitor to Doha like you, so you know, I can, can't control your movements. So um, we have, by way of conclusion to what was, I think, um, an extremely interesting and expansive uh, series of discussions this morning, uh, a roundtable discussion on sectarianism and the state. And I've spoken to my fellow presenters, Toby. Oh, I've got the wrong one. So I, I am, <laughs> I'm the one who uh, perhaps ate too much over lunch. <laughs> so today we're talking about definitions, sectarianism and communitarianism across regions. So we had a quick chat amongst the three of us, uh, Morton and Toby, and we thought we might um, start maybe each of us talking for about 10 minutes or so on our notions, our definitions, our senses of sectarianism. And what's become very apparent, uh, it seems to me, is that uh, there is no one agreed um, notion or definition of sectarianism, nor would that be appropriate given that uh, we've, um, I think, uh, been uh, shown that there are a variety of contexts, historical, social, religious, ethnic, and so on. So any definition that does emerge may be loose and uh, suitably fluid. Um, so I'm going to uh, perhaps um, suggest that we speak for 10 minutes each and then we would throw the floor open, right? It is a round table after all, and I think uh, it's more than just the three of us. So we could call on all of you um, to contribute and maybe just to give us some sense of uh, your working definition of sectarianism uh, and how it has informed your own uh, particular research questions, fields or domains. Um, so if um, that's enough to be getting on with, uh, might I call on you, Toby, maybe to... Uh, to <laughs> Morton? <laughs> Too much food. Morton, <laughs> to kickstart um, our discussions, and I'll turn this off. I will turn this on. I, my my kickoff uh, for the round table, I, I have some three major points. Uh, and my point of departure uh, is a small piece by Eric Davis back in 2008 uh, where he was criticized the way sectarianism was discussed. And his argument was that we have too much, of, of too much data and too little theory. Too little theorization, too little conceptualization uh, about uh, sectarianism, and we have plenty of data, but we need some analytical tools. I think a lot, of, lot, have, lot has happened since then, since 2008. Uh, I think there's becoming a much more uh, sophistication and uh, theoretical awareness, conceptual awareness, in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, that does not mean that, <coughs> that, that we have much agreement but it is a more sophisticated kind of confusion we have today compared to the past. And my, the first of my three points relates to the question about defining sectarianism. And in my view, sectarianism is an excellent example of what uh, W.B. Uh, Galley, uh, back in the 50s, would call an essentially contested concept. One of those concepts, all of which believe we know what it is, but then when we try to define it, we cannot agree upon it. And it actually carries political implications of which kind of definition will prevail. I think that's a quite nice uh, depiction of uh, the concept of sectarianism. And if you, as we also learned about in the morning uh, uh, by Asmi Bishara, it's a, actually a sociological concept emerging not from the Middle East, but from uh, a European debate on Christianity. And if you go to uh, Trussell and Weber and these kind of figures, it's quite interesting to observe what sectarianism is about. The sects are those outside of the church. And a sect is a thing you, you choose to belong to, contrary to the church. And uh, a, a, a sect is not hierarch hierarchical compared to 
uh, to the church is often not political. And many, and, and if you are trying to export that kind of notion of sectarianism to the Middle East, you really, it, it, it doesn't really fit. So, 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 so the question is that if, if the original meaning of the term sectarianism doesn't really fly to the Middle East or at least to a Shia Sunni Islamic context, uh, how has the term then been used uh, when in, in, a, uh, in, in, in a scholarship on the Middle East and sectarianism? And there you find a huge confusion. You, ha you find a confusion about who are we talking about. Sometimes sectarianism is, is about intra-faith relations between uh, Shias and Sunnis, like in uh, the equivalent in the, in, in the Christian debate between the Protestant Catholics. But then at other times, uh, for instance, if, if, if you go to Lebanon, uh, 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 it is also about Christians and Muslims. And if you go to Egypt, for instance, sectarianism is often referred to as being the relations between Copts and Muslims. So it is interfaith, not intrafaith relations. And then at other times, if you, for instance, go to Iraq, then you also have Kurds in the equation, which is an ethnic group. So, so, so there's a huge confusion as for whether we are talking about <coughs> groups belonging to the same faith, group belonging to different faiths, or does it not, ha not ha have anything to do with faith? So that's the first kind of confusion. Another kind of co confusion is what is, what is sectarianism about? Uh, is it a feeling? Is it the, the feeling just being a feeling I'm share? Is it, is it enough to be sectarian? Has it something to do with a politicization of certain identities? Or does it require uh, that you saying I am the um, I, I I have the right face and the others they have they they, they, they don't be, uh, have the right face the right version of the religion does it entail uh, violence hatred uh, denying of the other there's a huge confusion and part of the, the part of the reason why people disagree about the the degree of sectarianism you find in a certain context may also be related to the fact that uh, they have did different parameters or standards for what it requires to be sectarian, actually. So, 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 so there, there's a huge confusion as for what we talk about, and if we go back to uh, Gali, then he would say that it would most likely be uh, 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 impossible to agree upon one definition. And then we could, one way to go around then, as Van Haddad, for instance, has argued in a famous article in Middle East Journal from 2017 where he, he examined this confusion of ways of, of using the term sectarianism that we should, we, we should just get rid of the term. I think uh, it is an, uh, that, 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 that the, the, the concept is out there and we cannot abolish it. So I, I don't think it is a viable strategy. But we could at least be very clear when we are writing what we actually mean, what, what we're talking about when we talk about sectarianism. Or, and, 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 and another strategy at going align with, with uh, Gali would also to, to, to examine the implication of different kinds of definitions of sectarianism. And that brings me to, 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 to an, an another element in my first point about what I call comparative sectarianism. I think there's a need, uh, and I think we have actually... Uh, in the first paper, uh, in, 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 in one of the papers, the second paper uh, to today, um, uh, seen an example of that, that there's a tendency when we talk about sectarianism, we talk about Shia Muslim relations in the Middle East. But it could be interesting to examine whether sectarianism is, is the difference between what we're seeing if we see it, if we is Shia Sunni relations in a Middle Eastern context com compared to a non-Middle Eastern context, for instance, in Pakistan or India, or for instance, we had a, 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 a workshop a couple of, of, of years ago uh, on comparative sectarianism where we uh, talked about, where we had a paper on Shia Sunni relations in Norway. And it, it was quite interesting also to, 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 to examine what are the relations between a minority and a minority within a minority. What kind of relations do you find here compared to, to, to other kind of contexts? And what about the kind of 
sectarianism you associate with Shia Sunni sectarianism, is it different or similar to the kind of Christian, Jewish, Hindu, etc. Sectarian, sectarian, sectarianism? For instance, some have argued that, that the Middle East is, is experiences, experiences uh, their uh, uh, 30 years war with reference to the European uh, pre-Westphalian uh, 30 years war. Does it make sense at all making these kind of comparisons, uh, one could ask. So I think there's a need also to, to, to reflect upon uh, is sectarianism, is it the same thing we're talking about when we're talking about it in different contexts, also when it, it relates, relates to different faiths, also if it at, at, at all has anything to do with faith. The second point I will raise is if you go up in the, in the ladder of abstraction and then ask to what extent is sectarianism just an example of identity politics? To what extent sectarianism, as a, what is so sectarian about sectarianism, so to speak? Is it just an equivalent to other forms of identity politics? For instance, can we replace ethnic politics with sectarian politics? Or do we find different kinds of dynamics I think that is also worthwhile reflecting upon. I think that one one way to to reflect upon this could be by a distinction about uh, which as a Brubaker uses uh, actually in a discussion about religious identities, but I think it can be used here. Here he, here he makes a distinction between what he calls diacritical and normative understandings of identities. A diacritical understanding of identity is there, and identity is, so to speak, empty. And that identity is, is just a way to mark the in-group and the out-group. So the dynamics you will find between a Manchester City, Manchester United fan, and a Shia and Sunni would be the same. It is just a way to make a distinction between the in-group and out-group, but, but, but the identity as such is empty compared to the normative understanding of identity, where identity is also a, a kind of lens through which you imagine reality. And identity, identities are also associated with notions about the good life, what is appropriate behavior, and so on and so forth. And if you subscribe to a normative understanding of identities, that would mean that you, should, that you might make a difference between ethnic politics and sectarian politics. It might also mean that, um, for instance, anti-Shiism and anti-Shia anti sectarianism and anti-Sunni sectarianism might be different and uh, be associated with different kinds of dynamics. So, 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 so I think it is worthwhile reflecting upon how identities, are they empty? So you can just replace them or it does it make a difference which kind of identity you, you speak about? And that also carries implications when you're studying a phenomena. Because if identities are basically empty, then you can use theories from all other kinds of fields on identity politics, on sectarian politics. Because basically it's the same kind of dynamics you will find anywhere. But you cannot import theories from completely different kinds of fields if you assume that sectarian politics is associated with distinct kind of dynamics. So, so th that is also worthwhile reflecting upon. And then the, my last point uh, is instead of going up the ladder of abstraction, it would go down and then asking whether it makes sense disaggregating the concept of sectarianism. There you can say you have a debate between the lumpers and the splitters. Lumpers would lump all kinds of sectarianism together, whereas the splitters will insist that you have to make a distinction, you, make a, you, you need to have some typologies between different kinds of sectarianism. Uh, and that might be quite useful. For instance, earlier this morning we had a discussion about the role of, of religion and sectarianism. And it, it's obvious, so, some places religion really doesn't matter. But at other places, for me at least, it, it appears that it, it, it matters. It, so, so in some forms of, say, sectarianism, doctrinal issues might play a role. And at other, at, in, in other forms of sectarianism, it really, do, really does not matter. 
But of course, we have the, the question, even if we agree that we should split the concept of sectarianism in different subforms, the question is how to do that. And there, there are, if you look at the existing literature, there are a lot of offers on the market. Some would make a distinction between social and political sectarianism. Some would talk, talk about top-down or bottom-up sectarianism. So some will uh, talk about sectarianism promoted by sectarian entrepreneurs and by non-entrepreneurs. Uh, some would talk about banal sectarianism, instrumental sectarianism, and doctrinal sectarianism. So there's also a challenge, even for those who agree that we should subdivide sectarianism in different kinds, also to, to, to uh, reflect upon which kind of typology would then be the most useful kind of, of a typology. And just as the last point, as a kind of way of uh, bringing the word to uh, Toby, is also, as I briefly m mentioned also earlier to today, there's a tendency that there's a huge, there's much scholarship uh, on sectarianism which focuses on Lebanon. And it's completely uh, valid, okay, to, to make scholarship of Lebanon a fascinating place and so on. And it's also the most likely case if you want to study sectarianism, because you have an institutionalized form of, of sectarianism. But sometimes my experience is when I went to conferences and, 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 and talked with people on sectarianism, that they have not really reflected upon whether you're talking about, about Lebanon or whether you're talking about sectarianism per se as such. And it might be that the kind of sectarianism you are seeing in Lebanon, you might also see it in Iraq, where you have also kind of institutionalized system, but maybe in the Gulf, the kind of dynamics you are seeing there are quite different. Uh, and that would be the bridge uh, for me to pass the word to, to Toby. Thank you very much, uh, Morten. Um, first of all, let me start by thanking the Arab Center, uh, uh, Dr. Azmi Bishara and uh, Dan Al Kurd for organizing this. Um, I think um, by bringing you all together here and talking about this uh, important subject, uh, you know, something has been achieved in itself because um, uh, this is obviously, you know, it used to be at least still quite a sensitive topic, including in the Gulf, as I myself had to uh, discover. So I think it's very nice that uh, we can talk about uh, all of these things here um, very openly. Um, perhaps uh, initially um, I would like to point out that um, uh, I think it's really important that we also take time away to really think about the terminology that we're using. Um, so Morton has just said that, and in the morning, the opening lecture has in a way forced us to, to, to think about uh, terminology uh, very, you know, closely. And um, I think it's also very important, and I think a lot of the papers actually do that, is really engaging with the uh, Arabic um, debates on the subject, uh, including obviously the origin of the key terms that we're somehow uh, using here. And so a lot of work has, has now been done in that field, and I would encourage uh, all the, 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 the emerging scholars to really also read that and, and really build that into their work. Uh, in particular, this whole debate about uh, you know, the, 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 the problem with the um, uh, sociology of religion and study of religion that comes from a Christian and, and uh, a context or, or, or Judaism context applied to, to Islam. I mean, in a sense, it's now an old debate. It's, it, quite a lot has been written about it, but, but nonetheless, um, uh, a lot of mistakes are still being made. So, so as has been mentioned, I suppose, in the morning, we should, we should try to take what is, what is useful from that general sociology of religion, uh, Max Weber, and so on and so forth. And some things are still useful, but really try to build from the bottom up with, with more more specific knowledge um, of Arabic or Farsi or Turkish or, or, or whatever the language is that is spoken in the context that you are uh, working on and really kind of connect uh, the two, the more kind of, you know, theoretical approaches with the things that are really, that can kind of build uh, from the ground up. And as far as I understand, this is also a bit the project here. So I'm very uh, grateful to be here to, to kind of engage um, with that uh, uh, more thoroughly. Um, I'm, I'm doing this in a, in a new, um, major book project that I've been writing in the last few years um, uh, anyway myself. I mean, I'm trying to write a kind of long durée global history of Sunni-Shi relations, 
which is kind of crazy, but it's in some ways trying to look at exactly uh, the things that we've been talking about uh, today, trying to understand at what point uh, did communities emerge and started to see themselves as particular communities, and at what points in history was this not uh, uh, yet the case. And um, I think a lot of the kind of micro studies that we're seeing over the next few days are also uh, dealing with these um, uh, broader questions. Um, again, looking at many of the papers, I would like to congratulate you for choosing really interesting uh, uh, micro studies. Uh, many of you are enlightening new, th you know, new things that that I didn't know about or or didn't know about in in, in so much detail. And you're really ri jumping right into uh, the big debates. So so that is um, uh, uh, all uh, well and good. Um, now, when we look at uh, uh, different approaches, I suppose Morton has already mentioned that we kind of think on the one hand, right, we're all here and we can all talk to each other because somehow, uh, you know, we work on somehow similar things. But then, of course, we need to be, uh, um, you know, very cautious about generalizing from, let's say, Lebanon uh, to, you know, uh, Lucknow in India, where, for example, I spent last Muharram. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, of course, things which remind you of Lebanon, but there are many, many other things, and, of course, many more that are very, very different. Um, but at the same time, for example, uh, in a sense, uh, a really historically grounded work that tries to connect different regions, look at the interactions, intellectual uh, exchanges, um, economic exchanges, travels of, of, of clerics or non-clerics, the, also the political connections between different political movements from one country to another. Um, uh, all of that, I think there's still a lot of room uh, uh, for that to be done. And so, for example, in the morning, uh, this paper on Al Irfan, which I thought was, was very good, uh, was very important because, um, you know, these kind of, a couple of these very important uh, early 20th century uh, intellectual magazines, they, they had obviously global reach. Um, I mean, they were published in Arabic, but they were read from Latin America to India. And um, uh, in them, there were quite a lot of debates and there were really these tensions between, uh, well, engaging with the modern world, engaging with the colonial presence, but also therefore engaging with the idea of the modern state um, with an emerging nationalism, both an Arab nationalism and territorial nationalism in the particular places. And at the same time, ideas of Islamic community, so Sunnis and Shis together, but at the same time also specific, more communal forms of belonging to broader, uh, broader communities outside of the borders of the particular state that uh, they were located in. And so I think studies moving forward, I think what will be really interesting is to try to really do kind of, you know, on disentangling all of these things, different developments and seeing, you know, because all of these things were broadly happening at the same time, and we'll be talking more about it in the next few days, but in the early 20th century, you had all of these kind of different forces kind of operating at the same time, and they operated also, um, uh, yeah, with, with the emerging print culture and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, so in these new kind of print mediums, many different ideas, some of them in actually competing directly were propagated. And so if we look back um, from now at some of these key journals, including uh, Al-Manar, which in some ways is the, was the kind of uh, the, the Sunni equivalent of Al-Irfan, if you like, or the, the pan-Islamic equivalent, you can find many, many different ideas in it. And I think uh, also to be, to be kind of honest, um, when we do kind of historical work now that um, you know, it, one period wasn't, you know, there wasn't only one thing and then at some point something happened and it became totally sectarian, if you like. But just to be honest that, um, well, you know, sectarian identity mattered at, at many different periods. It just maybe mattered in different ways uh, than in later periods. Um, so in a sense, not to try to think in this black and white terms, uh, which, you know, many people kind of still operate uh, according to, partly because the sectarian, in a sense, became a very negative category uh, in popular discourse, but also um, in academic uh, uh, writing. So having said that, I do think that in some regions, the literature is much more uh, developed. So Lebanon, obviously, because it's been quite easy to study it, and because it is the very political system, every political party, more or less, I mean, most political parties have in some form or another 
uh, a sectarian um, constituency, uh, at least, if not a political program. Um, uh, so therefore, there is a lot we can learn from Lebanon, also because in the 19th century, as had been mentioned, it was exposed early on to a kind of confessionalization that was tied to uh, or European colonialism and so on and so forth. But other countries, um, such as, um, uh, well, the Indian context has also been studied, uh, northern India, in, in really uh, quite a lot of depth, and, and there's also quite refined social science and historical scholarship on uh, India, particularly the ideals of communalism, inter theoretically quite interesting uh, work. Um, but other countries, I think, are still understudied, partly because it's been, it was very difficult to do uh, research there. These in, used to include countries in the Gulf, but also uh, Iraq, because Iraq was kind of closed for researchers, and it's still uh, difficult to do really on the ground uh, field work. But it's, uh, I mean, obviously, especially for Sunni-Shi relations, it's incredibly important, and the amount of libraries and, and, and shrines and, 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 and intellectual families and, and so on. I mean, it's just uh, incredible. So I mean, in a sense, uh, there are still, I mean, in a sense, the field is growing, but the field is also wide open. So I want to, in a sense, encourage you all to, to do much more. Um, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, Pakistan, there's quite interesting literature uh, also on Pakistan. Um, uh, but again, there could be, there could be much uh, uh, more um, uh, done. Just perhaps um, lastly on terminology, I mean, I do think it's, it's really important that we're careful um, when we use some of the terminology, uh, uh, including orthodoxy and heterodoxy, for example, uh, because this has actually been used in a very normative way and in a way uh, to kind of denigrate, uh, 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 well, parts of Islamic uh, history or, or movements in Islamic history that perhaps did not become the dominant uh, uh, branch. But um, again, this was, these were actually two concepts that were imported from, uh, I mean, Christian uh, uh, study of religion, so the church sect context, and I think do not really uh, fit the, um, the Islamic um, uh, context. And um, so, I mean, in a sense, today we're really just trying to open uh, the debate here. Uh, we'll be having another roundtable on the state and sectarianism and giving our own talk. So, you know, we don't want to say too much now, um, but just, uh, I mean, uh, to encourage you all to, to you know, to, to really profit from this time here, um, interact with each other and with all of us. And, and really, we can really have this, use this time to rethink some of the key concepts. And I mean, that would be uh, my hope here. So. Without further ado, I will pass the microphone to Mark. Thank you, Toby. And may I reiterate once again my personal thanks to uh, Dr. Bishara and the Arab Center for the invitation to uh, be present today and over the course of the following days. And I wanted, um, following on from my colleagues, just maybe to um, ask some questions about sectarianism and how useful, how fit for purpose is, is the term sectarianism? It strikes me as actually quite a, an old-fashioned and almost uh, antiquated an antique concept in its, in its original milieu as it was perhaps best used and first used maybe in the 16th century when the Protestant Reformation unleashed this incredible fragmentation in Western European uh, Christianity. So, Sectarianism, it seems to me, in its original uh, derivation, application, is about fragmentation, okay? It's, it's about people breaking off power of the Bible, unleashes this incredible dynamic. The man in the street or the man in the field can communicate directly with God. He no longer needs the Roman Catholic priest to intercede on his behalf. He goes off and does his own thing, and that unleashes this domino effect, which I'd like to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is a strange place, it seems to me. I, I'm not Northern Irish, by the way, so I, I can look in, but I understand what's going on. It's maybe the last place in Western Europe, and I could be contradicted, where there appears to be a, sectar a sectarian conflict, but maybe with the exception of Glasgow and Liverpool, where there are outliers. Um, would anybody contradict that? Do you know of a society in Western Europe? Western. Western Europe. I'm talking about Western Europe now. I'm not talking about... Uh, but it does I mean, happen in Europe. It's, it's uh, yeah. 
I mean, Anybody? One, one problem is that we're always talking about conflict, and in a sense, one I don't want to take your time, but in a sense, what, what I would like to us to be more honest about is really to know a bit more about European history, particularly since the Reformation. And, and, and <coughs> so if we take I sectarian identity as an important category politically and socially and culturally, then this is actually still the case in every society in Europe. It's not the key you know, category of, of a political conflict. But it, it depends but on how you define why, sectarianism, right? And what uh, it's about. But, but in a sense, that's, so for example, in Switzerland, it's still an important, Marker. it's still an important category. The last civil war in the 19th century was fought according to sectarian lines, but no one ever talks about it because it was somehow, you know, it's, it's, it's not really taught in It, it doesn't anymore. fit with the uh, Swiss image for uh, modernity Indeed. and Indeed, yeah? but so in a sense, if we do comparative studies, more to be kind of more honest also with our analysis of European uh, uh, history would be something that I'm particularly interested in. Could I, could I maybe uh, just uh, start with a, a short quote, um, and it's from an English actor and writer called Quentin Crisp who in the 1970s and 80s had a sort of a wandering tour where he did a, a one-man show. And, and the quotation goes, when I told the people of Northern Ireland that I was an atheist, a woman in the audience stood up and said, yes, but is it the God of the Catholics or the God of the Protestants in whom you don't believe? <laughs> All right? So Northern Ireland may seem unusual if you're to walk the streets. There is no evident ethnic marker of uh, difference. There's no obvious social marker of difference. There's no obvious linguistic marker of difference. They're all Christians. It may seem baffling to the outsider as to what's going on. So I wanted to maybe just try and talk about sectarianism, what it might mean in, in the context of Northern Ireland. And I'm becoming uh, rapidly aware that sectarianism is a pretty elusive creature, and it seems to take different guises and different regions. Um, but it's not, in the Northern Irish case, necessarily about religion. It's not about people who are getting upset about religious or theological controversies which date back to the 16th century. It's not about a belief in the presence of Christ in the, in the, uh, in the sacrament of communion. It's not about the position of the Virgin Mary. People aren't losing sleep overnight about the literal meaning of the Bible, okay? It's about something deeper and uh, much more sustained, it seems to me. It's about power and status. But in its, in its everyday manifestation, everyday manifestation, and, and sectarianism manifests itself in all sorts of different ways, some uh, pretty vicious, uh, some nuanced and actually quite subtle. Um, but I think sectarianism uh, in the context of the north of Ireland is about prejudice, it's about discrimination, it's about hatred arising from relations of inferiority or superiority. Okay, So at some level there is an elemental psychological conflict going on. It may not manifest itself in, in physical violence, but there is a there is a current of violence which defines sectarianism. And I think in, in this day and age, um, we're all much more conscious of how easily offense can be given to people from different backgrounds and so on. So the, the casual um, sectarianism of the past now becomes so much more obvious. Um, I'd like to talk about, um, it's not about, I think Dr. Bashar has said, it's not about sex, X, and, and this is a very hard word to pronounce, uh, sex, S-E-C-T-S, -S, okay? Sex are some, they're not churches, they're breakaway groups who form their own particular um, um, groups uh, to worship as, as they deem fit. Um, sectarianism is, is about, in the, in the Christian context, is about different churches, most obviously, uh, Protestant churches versus the Catholic church. Uh, in the north of Ireland, it's also about identity. It's about your everyday identity, how you define your nationality or your regional identity, your social identity. So it manifests itself there as uh, people who identify as British or people who identify as Irish. Now, the problem with that is that these identities are shifting, particularly the, um, the, Brit the notion of Britishness. Uh, the notion of Britishness, it seems to me, has taken an incredible battering uh, over uh, recent years. 
Uh, the very notion of the United Kingdom uh, now has a, a distinct question mark over it uh, as, yeah. as Brexit manifests itself in, 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 in tensions within the UK. Uh, so sectarianism is, is, is at one level about which church you belong to. But it's not about the depth of your attachment to the church or the sincerity of your belief in the teachings of that church. It's about um, a much broader ensemble of issues such as um, one church may represent a superior social uh, position in society. It may uh, enable access to economic advancement it may enable advancement to political power. So it's about a, a complex, it's about a, an arrangement of, 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 of issues and, um, I, and um, themes. So sectarianism in the North of Ireland is very much about, uh, it's a marker of ethnic and cultural identity. Traditionally, the two camps, Irish tend to be Catholic, Protestant, look to antecedents from um, England or Scotland, they identify as British. It, that introduces a new uh, theme, that of colonialism. So, uh, and, and, and one, you know, it was very interesting this morning for me as an outsider to hear about um, the role of colonialism in Iraq, for instance. And I know it's, it's, a, it's a more pervasive um, issue within the Middle East generally. But how do, um, how do colonial regimes, governments, administrations, how did they exploit issues of potential sectarianism or sectarianism on the ground to reinforce their own particular hegemony? And I think in that respect, um, the whole uh, notion of imagined communities, which um, has been with us now for quite a long time, I think almost 30 years, if not more, um, still has a, a, a certain validity, a currency, which enables us to get our head around how um, identities are created. And, uh, as I think um, you pointed out this morning very effectively uh, in your paper, um, how media, how uh, the print revolution, how effective that has been. Um, my sense is that sectarianism is often uh, associated with backwardness. Uh, it's, it's a sign of a, a less developed society, perhaps. Uh, in the context of Western Europe, Northern Ireland seems an aberration, bizarre, strange, uh, when viewed from the context of London, it often seems incomprehensible. This seems to many English people, British people, uh, are, are in Britain itself, uh, that this is a, a manifestation of battles which were you know, long fought and long lost in many cases in Britain during the 17th century. So this seems to be this strangely um, strange time capsule, lost, uh, lost in time, literally. But I would like to suggest that maybe in a colonial context or a neo-colonial context, I need to be careful with my language here, that where you have the intrusion of a large ethnic grouping who um, have a different religious identity, whose religious identity is tied up with, in this case, British identity, um, that you, you enable uh, and you provide fertile ground for the sort of sectarian dissension that, that uh, the north of Ireland has seen. It's a state that was founded in 1921. Uh, it had a, um, a, a created, inverted commas, Protestant majority. It was left to its own devices until it began to fester and erupted into violence in the late 60s. I'm going to talk a bit about it in my presentation, so I don't want to preempt that. So there's a, a whole range of, of things that I think need to be taken into account when we talk about um, um, sectarianism in the Northern Irish context, but also, I suspect, um, closer to home here in the Middle East. Yes, religion. Religion is there and can't be discounted, right? But also, it's this, this, this nucleus, it's, this, this, it's kind of almost like a paradigm. Ethnic identities, there's also the question of class, and because class speaks directly to power. Uh, there's also the question of maybe not just national identity, but regional identities. Uh, there's the question of education. How is sectarianism perpetuated? Because if, if you look at Northern Ireland, um, religious, formal religious attendance and affiliation has begun to drop uh, over the past two decades. So these are less religious society. It's a less religious society than it was in the 1960s or 50s. So why does the dynamic of sectarianism continue then? 
um, because it is attached, and it's, it's a multi, uh, it's a multi-tiered uh, animal, as it were. Education, it seems to me, is important. In the context of Northern Ireland, education is on a denominational basis. Most people go to either a Protestant or a Catholic school, so that acts as, as uh, again, as, as as an enabler. Um, culture, uh, which I don't want to talk about, but culture is there as well. And I think um, at the at the moment this kind of political and cultural dualism and religious that was Irish Catholic versus uh, British Protestant looks quite shaky. It looks like um, it, 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 it's not going to be around forever, but what replaces it? I, I think notions of, of Britishness in, in a kind of a neo-colonial context, as I've said, um, are, are, are changing very rapidly. Um, the rise of English nationalism where does that leave Britishness? How do you define Britishness? Um, traditionally, Britishness was, was centered on um, the monarchy uh, and, the, uh, and the Protestant church, the Church of England and its offshoots. Okay? Um, they seem to me today to be much less meaningful, uh, much less capacious, much less potent. Um, so there are a variety of factors that, that are changing. Um, and I'd like to look at them perhaps uh, with you when, when I give my, my presentations. Um, and my notion, I think, of, of, of sectarianism has, has taken a bit of a beating today. Um, it's become a lot less uh, certain in its definition, um, and it's become a much more protein or a much more fluid and uh, rather uh, elusive um, creature. I have um, exceeded my, my 10 minutes, um, so perhaps um, it, it's time to open. Actually, Would you like to add a, a right? Actually, I, I realized I had not three but four points, and, and maybe I'm, I will be, would be interested in having some reactions from you on, on my last fourth point, which is we have talked about grasping, about defining sectarianism, but there is also the question about grasping sectarianism, what should we look for? How do we observe it? How do we find it? And, 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 and how do you position yourself in that question? Because I would say there's a challenge as for seeing too much and seeing too little sectarianism. What are the possible ways of grasping sectarianism? Okay, one way is to look at demography. Places where you have Shia and Sunnis, you must have a sectarianism. And where you don't have, you don't have uh, sectarianism. And of course, there's the pitfall where, for instance, if you go to a place like Yemen, until quite recently, you had Shias and Sunnis, but sectarianism didn't, was not really the big issue. And then you, if you quite recently go to places like uh, Egypt and uh, to some extent Jordan, you find a uh, wariness among Sunnis uh, on, 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 on uh, 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 Shias. If you look at the Pew poll, for instance, some of the places where most Sunnis say that Shias are not really Muslims happen to be places where there are no Shias. So, so demography does not necessarily tell us much. Okay, what, what should we do then? Okay, we could look at attitudes, to, at uh, surveys. And uh, surveys might tell us something. One kind of service is, are you uh, worried about, concerned about sec sec sectarianism? But, 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 but then the challenge is, if there's so much confusion about what sectarianism is, missed, do we actually, 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 actually know what people uh, answer, as what, what they mean about sectarianism when we ask them, if, if, if there are so many different meanings about what sectarianism actually is? And, 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 and what about if there is a taboo? Often it is said that there's this, uh, that sectarianism is something you accuse others for. I'm not sectarian, you are, sex, you are se, se, sectarian. So if you're asking people, actually, do, do you know their attitudes? And then actually, so, so, so there you could assume that people are more sectarian than, 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 than what they would be willing to tell. But Steve Brooks has made a quite interesting experiment in uh, Egypt a couple of, of years ago. It, it got... Uh, uh, and it has appeared in a journal article where he, in a quite sophisticated experiment, asked people if, if uh, Sunnis, if they were, be, they were willing to live next door a, a, a Shia. And then one group were asked where uh, others 
could know what they answered. And there was another group who were completely sure, nobody knew, even those who, as a, even Steve Brook didn't know who exactly answered what. Uh, uh, and, and, and there it, it tur tur turned out that if you couldn't be, could be completely certain that nobody would know what you answered, people would be less sectarian and be more willing to live next to, to, to a Shia. And there he, he concludes that at, at that time in, in Egypt there was a social pressure of being anti-Shia. So pe people tried to conform to the social norms and it had nothing to do actually with the private attitudes, uh, but they tried to conform. So there's the danger as for if you have service that we're seeing too little or too much. Then we can also look at rhetoric. And, but as we talked about earlier today, if you look at the official speeches uh, in Syria, for instance, before 2011, there would be no sectarianism. And if you look at the speeches uh, in Bahrain, uh, in Syria, after 2011, everything would be about sectarianism, but maybe the protesters, their main demands had nothing to do with sectarianism. So, so there's also the pitfall here that we either end up seeing too much or too, too, too little if we only look at, at uh, rhetoric. Then we can also look at institutions. That's quite interesting if you look at places like Lebanon, like I Iraq, but there are other places where, the, where sectarianism is not reflected in the, is in, in the in, in, in institutions. And then finally, also, of course, you can also look at behavior, actual behavior. What kind of alliances do you find? How, how do people group and so on and so forth? But there are different strategies and, and maybe we need to, to combine, to, to, to triangulate uh, different kind of methods in order to, to understand what's going on. And then you also have the distinction from anthropology between ethic, ethic, uh, ethic emic understandings. The, uh, the, 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 the Paul Sy approach would be to, to try to explain what really goes on, no matter what people are saying, whereas the anthropological emic understanding is to, is to actually to understand what is reality like for people. What is their worldview? A colleague of mine who is an, 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 an anthropologist had an anecdote from a friend from Bahrain whose uh, son applied for scholarship and uh, he, he didn't get it. And, and they were Shia, and then they explained uh, that it's because we're Shia he didn't get the scholarship. It might be it was because he had bad grades. But from an emic understanding, it's actually interesting to know how they rationalize the fact that their son didn't get the scholarship, no matter why, it, they, 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 they're the real reason. Because if it is so, as Weber would say, that people react in, to, 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 in the world to, to, according to, to the meaning the world has to them, it is important to know something about what kind of meaning the, the, the world has to people. So we, we need to understand, to know about how people experience the world. And then my very last point is, what are the, some, some of the pitfalls also with, with our obsession with sectarianism? Because what, is, what if we are looking for sectarianism? There was an article recently by Parkinson and, and a Russian on finding sectarianism in Lebanon, where they were quite critical. They were pointed to how sectarianism has become quite sexy. Uh, it's if, if, if you get... Uh, and, 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 and if you want to, uh, to, 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 to do some field work, uh, Lebanon is an easy place to, to go to. And if you want to do some surveys, there are an, a survey industry in Lebanon providing you with uh, to, 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 do to, to do surveys. And, and, and these uh, survey uh, 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 bureaus, uh, uh, they know what you would like to, to, to get. So, 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 so they are equipped to, 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 to do surveys that is about sectarianism. But Lebanon is not only about sectarianism. Lebanon is about so much else. But by having this, all these scholars go, going to Lebanon asking about sectarianism all the time, you may end up producing sectarianism. And an anecdote also here was uh, an, 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 an anthropologist I, I once met doing fieldwork among uh, Iraqis in uh, Iraqi refugees in Jordan uh, pointed to that many of uh, those who went to these uh, camps actually had flat sectarianism and wanted to, to get rid of uh, sectarianism. And the first approach, the, the first answer, the first question they, they made by the 
international aid workers were Ayu Shia and Sunni. So, so that was the category they, they were perceived through, and, and, and quite soon they, they, they learned how, what, the, what the right answer would, would be when they should uh, 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 to, to, to these uh, aid workers. So we should also be re reflective upon that in social sciences we are also pro producing our facts, or we are part of that reality we observe. And that's maybe also good to have in mind. Um, well, slightly different, but in a sense, uh, uh, what you just uh, told us, Mark, is exact, in some ways exactly what I would like more people to do, uh, and also when looking at the Islamic world or the Middle East. So you said, for example, Britishness, what, is, you know, what is it constructed around? So you said the monarchy and the Church of England, which was specifically constructed breakaway church as a church for that country and to give legitimacy to that new project, political project there. Um, and it has remained at the heart of that since, despite declining religiosity and so on and so forth. Um, at the same time, you mentioned that, well, colonialism and kind of the cooperation of certain groups based on their sectarian identity with another power, um, and then, you know, the urban fabric, the way in which, uh, you know, cities were, you know, set up and so on and so forth, played into that kind of, you know, larger uh, dynamic. So, in a sense, this is exactly um, what I think, you know, should a kind of a more honest and comparative, perhaps, approach of, of you know, early modern or modern history uh, of Europe and the Middle East, uh, what, what it should look uh, uh, like and look for. Because if you take that approach, um, actually, in, in most nationalisms, you do have, in some form or another, a national church or a dominant form of sectarian identity that has informed key themes uh, of that uh, nationalism. And that's not exclusive to the Middle East or to Europe or anywhere else, but it's just uh, uh, one way in which nationalism actually uh, became constructed. And um, if we're then a bit more honest, you know, you also then don't have necessarily this juxtaposition of sectarian identity on the one hand and national identity on the other, and one being seen as a really good thing and the other um, necessarily uh, as a bad thing. Um, we do have now quite a lot of studies that look comparatively at particularly the 16th and 17th century as ages of confessionalization. The term has been mentioned uh, in the morning as well, but you know, this is the period of the Reformation in Europe, the, you know, the splitting away of, of, uh, of, of major parts of Christianity from the Catholic Church, um, and then very long uh, and vicious wars, which however are not just wars based on faith, they're when princes or particular rulers embrace one uh, interpretation of religion or the other and use it in their political projects um, that these wars kind of, you know, turn into real wars that also last for, for decades. And, and one thing that is, I suppose, not often remembered is that at the same time that the, the Habsburgs are engaged in all of those wars, they're also fighting with the Ottomans, and the Ottomans themselves are obviously fighting with the Safavids. And so, in a sense, you have a kind of shared age of confessionalization where sectarian and religious identity plays an important political role and becomes sharpened, but becomes sharpened on both ends. So both on the kind of within Christianity, Protestant Catholic, Christian uh, uh, Muslim, but also Sunni Shi, um, and amongst many, and, and many other fault lines. But in a sense, looking at this a bit more honestly, rather than saying, you know, uh, the, you know Europe is in a sense secular and uh, uh, the Middle East is all sectarian. I mean, no one, I mean, these are the extreme types, but, but this, in a sense, it is implicit in some of the more biased studies uh, of the region. So, in a sense, thank you for showing us exactly, I suppose, mm -hmm. how one, one could do it uh, 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 in, in this part of the world. Yes or no? Would you like um, to add well, something? Well, yeah, thank you, Toby. I mean, uh, I, you know what? I, I, go I Googled sectarianism just for, to see what was going to come up, and what came up? Northern Ireland and the Middle East, and I thought, oh, that's that's kind of interesting. Why, 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 why these regions in particular? Because I, I think it's fair to say that um, sectarianism, as we're beginning to to grapple with it, is and how it manifests itself. What does it feel like? Can you touch it? What happens on the ground? That these are the sort of things we we need to talk about. Yeah, I I think to think that Europe is secular and somehow so advanced that you know it's not tainted by uh, um, sectarianism is absolute nonsense. I, I think there are perhaps low grade 
social manifestations of sectarianism of one sort or another in most European countries. Okay, um, and I'm you know particularly familiar with the, the Nordic countries, who would be perceived to be um, generally quite secular, right? Yeah, uh, uh, but are are not untouched by. <laughs> By the phenomenon, for instance, of a national church. I know, I know there's, there's been change in recent years, but you know, I may have picked on British identity as being tied to a particular national church, but you know, um, there, there were national uh, Lutheran churches. There still is in Denmark, right? There's a, it's a national church, unlike in Sweden. We have a church ministry. Mm. We have national churches. If you're, if, if you're going to name, the, to register the name of your child, you're going to the church no matter your, what faith you have, because it is outsourced to, to, the, to, to the church institution. It, it, the, of course, the, ch the child will, will not get baptized, but actually the institution doing it is the, is the, the is. church. Okay, I'm, I'm just very conscious that um, three, three of us have sort of talked at you. I'm also very conscious that I see a lot of very weary and tired faces looking at me. And I'm wondering, um, you know, how far can we push sectarianism today? Um, so rather than have you ask us questions, you, I mean, you're welcome to ask questions, but it seems to me that more profitably we, we might get a dialogue going amongst the participants uh, about maybe some working definitions of sectarianism or perhaps anti-definitions of sectarianism.